Today we're wrapping up our series uh, that we've been covering for the last three weeks called Crazy Like Us, and the gist of it is is that Christians uh, in their lives and in their, when, when they walk with Jesus shouldn't, should look a little bit different than those of us or our family and friends that don't walk with Jesus. And we cited a couple of key areas. Number one, we talk, the first week we talked about how Christians should be more courageous. There should be more gallantry to us. That, and what gives us reason for our courage? It's not because we're so strong and mighty, it's because we know what Jesus Christ has done for us, how he's secured the future, how he's promised to be with us. And so therefore we should not be, uh, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, um, we, don't, we don't want you to grieve over, they, were, they were, had some members of their, commu- their church that had passed away, and Paul says, we don't want you to grieve, brothers and sisters, as those who, do, as those who have no hope. So another, there's two ways to grieve. You could grieve with hope or grieve without hope. Christians should have a courageousness even in their grief, even in the face of death. There's a boldness to us. There's a, there's a walking into the lion's den boldness and courage to us. So when tragedy strikes or when circumstances go haywire, we're not sitting there going, oh, no, no, what do we do? What do we do? And you look no different, like Jesus says in Matthew 6. Uh, you look, the, do not say to yourself, what shall we eat or what shall we wear or what's going to happen? He says, for the pagans run after those things. And so when you're running after those things and you're constantly fussing about and going to pieces when tragedy strikes, Jesus says you look no different than the people who don't even believe there is a God. You should look different with your courage. You should also look different with your money. Christians should not be hoarders. They should be extremely sacrificial givers, and especially to their community of faith, which is, which is us here. We need to be sacrificially giving. 20 bucks isn't sacrificially giving for most of us. So we need to start rethinking where we're putting our, where we're putting our money because there's lots of people who could say, oh yes, I'm with, I'm with this, I'm with, I'm with you, I'm with you, but you look at their checkbook and they're really with something else. Because your, your checkbook is a good indicator of really what you value, if you want to know, if you don't know. Number three, we looked at Christians should be different in their relationships. Not that we don't have conflict as Christians, it's just that we should be the quickest to resolve it. What would be some reasons why someone wouldn't resolve an, a relationship issue? Because they feel they've been slighted or hurt in some way. And I'm, and, and I'm not going to... I'm not, I can't believe that he or she did that to me, and so mm, I'm just, I'm going to wait it out until they apologize, and if they don't apologize, then I go passive-aggressive, and we avoid people, and we say, oh, well, um, you know, I didn't see you there, and we get all, we do these weird, weird, passive-aggressive conflict, I don't, I don't even, and Jesus says that should never be happening amongst Christians. We should be the quickest to forgive, the quickest to resolve. Why? Because we know that our identity, the quickest to say I'm sorry, because we know our identity is not based on Jesus, is not on ourselves, but based on our performance, but based on Jesus Christ. So if you can't forgive, you're probably basing your your identity on something other than him. And Christians should look different with how quick they say they're sorry and how quick they forgive. So this last week in this series, we're going to look at how Christians should look different in one other key area. And this one isn't necessarily relationships or money. This is way bigger than that. And this one thing is why I bet, at least in my experience, this was true of me, and my guess is it's probably true of you. This, when you don't have a, a grasp or a comprehension of this one thing that I'm going to be that the Bible talks about, and I'm going to be exploring with us here, is why we possibly have a, a life that's a little bit disjointed, that we're nervous about the future. We have questions about what's going to happen and because you don't have this one thing that we're talking about today. And what is this one thing? I'm not going to tell you. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, this one thing is what the Bible calls, and we've, Christians have called it for, for thousands of years, is a, a calling. We're very familiar with careers, but I think the notion of a calling is, is something that's a bit foreign to our modern ears. I mean, you ask someone, what do you want to do when you grow up, you know, and that you get a career path. Very rarely do you hear people with a calling rather than a career path. And this is why some of us get up every Monday morning, you're enjoying your Sunday today, but you're going to get up Monday morning and get dressed and go to a job that you hate. 
Seriously. And you say, you know, I don't like it, but I got to pay the bills and you got to make a living. And the biblical message to you is, no, you don't have to make a living. You have to make a life. God wants you to have a life, not a living. And so you're sitting in a job that you hate that God probably never gifted you to be in and wants to, has, the Lord has a vision probably that's so much bigger than your vision for your life. And so we're going to look at an example in the Bible of someone with a calling today. And that's how Christians do look different. And it's not just in work. Christians should have a calling. Uh, it, it could be to work. It could be into family. It could be into uh, school. It could be into team sports. It could be into anything. But you should look different with a sense of direction and purpose to your dealings in this world and your life. And I don't think a lot of us have that. So we're going to look at we're going to look at Isaiah, book of Isaiah. Now Isaiah was a prophet around 700 BC, and this is uh, what happened to him. In the key, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is Isaiah's experience. He experiences something at church that he never thought he would experience. Now imagine this. Put yourself in his shoes. Here's sandals. <laughs> Put yourself in his sandals. Um, uh, you get up in the morning. You're going to go to church. And you, have an exper- you experience something that you never, ever, in your wildest imagination, thought that you would have experienced at a church. And what is this experience? What does he uncover at church? He finds God. Imagine that. He experiences God at church. Who... Who to thunk it? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, those are angels, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they called to one another. Here's where we get that famous Christian hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Yeah, only a couple of you know that song. So it's a triple, triple response. This is, this is for the Hebrew people and, you know, the, the Jews, if you, if you double something, it means increased significance. But if you triple something, nothing could be tripled. It, God is not just holy. He's the holiest of holies. He's holiest of holiest of holies. It's like a, you can't, you can't trump that. It's like a triple dog dare from the movie A Christmas Story. You remember seeing that movie where the kid sticks his tongue on the, under dare, sticks his tongue on the frozen pole, and he wouldn't do it. He goes, I dare you. He's like, ah. And he goes, I triple dog dare you. And you, that's like holy, holy, holy. Nothing gets above that. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, Isaiah writes, the doorpost and the threshold shook the temple, And the temple was filled with smoke. And then Isaiah says something that I would say if I was there, and you probably would too. Ah! Woe is me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Here, check this out. A surefire test that you've experienced God in reality not in your mind, but objectively real, is that you despise yourself. <laughs> when Job finally sees God, or, or God appears to him in Job chapters, chapters 38 to 42, what does he say at the end? I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you and I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. When you encounter the real God, I'm telling you, it's all through the Bible, you, get in, you go to your knees so if you have never had this experience of going onto your knees or in a season of deep, deep repentance, you've never experienced him. Whenever anyone, look at when Peter first experiences Jesus, right? It's the large catch of fish um, in, in the Gospel of Luke. And when he realizes that who Jesus is, he runs up to him, falls at his feet, and he says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. That's always the first step in experiencing God is that you have a sense of self-despicableness. That I, that I need to be on my knees repenting. And that's what Isaiah does. Woe to me, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. But then one of the angels flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. 
Notice the two things. He says your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Those are two different things. God could take our sin away, but more often than not, we hang on to the guilt. And what is, what is God saying to Isaiah? Not only am I objectively making you clean by taking your sin away, I'm also taking your guilt away. Where this doesn't get to be the functional reality of your heart, where you don't have to feel ashamed or feel guilty, I'm taking that. What a perfect forecasting of the cross of Jesus Christ, where not only is our sin atoned for, our guilt is taken away. Here. So we could live so free. And then I heard the Lord, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Now see, I wouldn't have done this. This is Isaiah is one of the few prophets who responds this way. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? God said. And I said, Here I am. Send me. And God said, Go and tell the, this people. So check this out. God says, okay, you're going to go, and here's your, here's your mission. How would you like this? Go and tell the people of Israel, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but not perceiving. I want you to make the heart of this people calloused, Isaiah. Make their ears dull, close their eyes. In other words, I'm calling you to be a public preacher and everyone is going to hate you and your sermons will stink. And there's your job. Go. Is that wild? (laughs) No one's going to listen to you, but I want you to go and preach my word and no one's going to listen to you. And they're going to hate you. And they're going to despise you. God says, Verse 11, Isaiah says, the question Dan would ask if this was my job description. Like, is, this, is it going to be like this for a couple of weeks? <laughs> I'm, cool. I'm cool for like a couple of weeks or even like a deployment. You know, like eight, nine months. But this is what Isaiah says. Then I said, for how long, Lord? <laughs> and he said, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid to waste. But as the terebinth and oak leaves stumps when they are cut down, leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. So basically he tells them, This is going to be your job until you die. So go, Isaiah. That's what you get for volunteering. Three things we hear about a calling here. Three things, and they're critically important. Number one, you have to have an encounter with God. Number two, you have to have the, the, I wrote here, it has to be a calling from God. And number three, you have to go on mission for God. Really quick again. Number one, you have to have an encounter with God. Number two, you have to have a calling from God. And number three, you go on mission for God. Christians should look different with that. Okay, ready? Here we go. Wake up. Uh, Number one, you have to have an encounter with God. What does that mean? Isaiah had an encounter with God. That's different than having a conception of God. And so let me confess, on behalf of all Lutherans everywhere, we have been terrible at this with our children. And I'm serious on this. Because we, for years and years and years and years and years and years, thought that if we taught our kids and put them in classes and gave them tests and and taught them about the Bible, we thought they were maturing in Christianity. That is, we thought giving kids information or people information equated to a spiritual maturity and discipleship, and we were wrong. Some of the most faithful and spiritually mature people I know couldn't quote you the Council of Nicaea or talk about the Greek or even, you know, 
the nuances of biblical interpretation of John chapter 1. They couldn't do that. And then the most spiritually mature, mature people I know, they're people that have worn out their knees on prayer. They're constantly wrestling with God's word. They're sacrificially giving it in, in their time and talent and treasure. They may not have all the knowledge that a college Bible professor would have, but they're far, far, far beyond those people. And we've screwed up. I remember when I realized that we as a church body had screwed up many, many years ago. Um, I remember I was looking from our confirmation program, how many, uh, this is about 15 years ago, how many kids we retained from our confirmation program throughout the rest of the life of the church. Anyone want to take a guess what the percentage was? Four. Four. And I assume that, I, and actually I've researched it, it's like in and around that percentage for most churches, main, mainline churches across the United States. And yet we just keep doing the same thing. And actually freak out if we want to change a confirmation. <gasps> you can't, what, what, what? That's how we strong arm our kids when they're in junior high. You can't take away that. We were, we, we were wrecking them is what we were doing. I'm serious. Because we were filling them up with information. I remember the confirmation lessons I was given the curriculum. It would be like, I remember one day I had to uh, teach the kids the Psalms. It was, that's the Bible lesson they were learning about. Was I said all 150? Yes. But you don't have to actually read all 150. Just tell them what the Psalms are. And I, and it, it, I went like. So I'm going to spend an hour talking to the kids about the Bible, but we're never going to read it. Is that? Is that? Am I hearing that correctly? Man. So we're busy doing all these things around the Bible and for God, but we're not really giving God to our kids. It's like, you know, I can't remember who said it. If the devil can't make you unfaithful, he's going to make you busy. <sighs> and so we equated filling our children up with academic information with having an encounter with God, and it doesn't work. And I do remember telling church leadership, 96%, and there was this one guy who said, hey man, you work for Boeing. Let's say you had a 96% failure rate on planes. And uh, what, what, what would happen? Well, a lot of people would die and you'd be fired. This is more important than planes. This is infinitely more important than even an open heart surgery where we're, we're, you know, we're holding a human life in our hands by their heart. This is infinitely more important to that. We're dabbling with people's eternal fates here. <laughs> and and, and, and our, our, our children and our grandchildren are turning away right now in the last 20 years from Jesus Christ at a faster rate than never been seen, in it, never been seen before in the history of our country because we've equated giving them information with an encounter with Jesus Christ. And do you know what they're hungering for when they're scrolling? Do you know what they're hungering for in uh, lewd, lewd pre premarital sexual relationships? Do you know what they're hungering for with friends and drugs? They're hungering for a genuine encounter. They're hungering with God. They're ha Guys, they're hungering for a calling. A calling. but they have to have an encounter with God like Isaiah did. And what do you mean an encounter like Isaiah? I mean like, I'm not expecting that you walk into the sand center and there's smoke and then there's angels flying around. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. But there, we're, has there ever been a season in your life or an area at, when you're at church or something that you're reading where God starts to transition from something that's in your head to something that's deeply, deeply uh, functional in the heart? where it's different than information, where, where you're stirred, where you're melted, where you fall on your knees, where you lift your hands up in praise, where you feel like your life is changing in, in a completely different way where he's getting a hold of the heart, where, the heart, where Jesus is more real to the heart than just a song or just a, a verse. That's called an encounter with him. And it, you may say, well, I've never had that then here's what you need to do. And I am eternally serious right now. If you haven't had uh, that in your life, immediately <clears throat> go into, uh, immediately get into repentance and prayer. Because that means that there's something prideful that's going on to where 
you can't see it. So go into repentance, go into prayer for the next couple weeks, and then he'll show you. But you have to have an encounter with God. You can't say, well, you know, my mom told me or my pastor told me. God has no grandchildren. You have to have an encounter with God. Existentially, individually, you. Okay, so that's number one if you want a calling. You have an encounter with God. Number two, you have to have a calling from God. So, by the way, if you haven't had number one, you could get up and you could go look at your phone for the rest of the sermon because points two and three don't, make it, don't matter. Go get number one figured out first. Okay, number two, you have to have a calling from God. What, what does that mean? It, ha- it can't come from you. <laughs> Usually, this is how it works. Okay, right? Am I, am I correct in this? This is how I was raised. This is how you're, you were raised. This is what I want to do with my life. Here's the direction that I want to go. Here's the job that I want. And um, God help me get there. Right? I, I'll, I'll call you in. God, I want to be a nurse. Pretty please get me into nursing school. Maybe being a nurse is great. Being a teacher is great. That's not what I'm saying. What you should first be asking him is, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to direct my life? And then I'll pray for you to direct. How do I get there? Not this is what I want. Help me get there. You should be, tell me what you want. Help me get there. That's, that's vastly different, and that will look different to people. How do you figure out what the calling is that's from God? Here, uh, number one I put here, how do you open your ears and start to, well, there's a couple things. Number one, you have to be available. Some of you aren't available. You're not the Isaiah. Here I am, send me. He was available. Some of you are too mucked up in, in your own crud relationships and you're so self-absorbed into your work that you can't, you're not available. You may have had an encounter with God at some point, but you're not available. You're, there is no here I am, send me. And so there's no calling. And so there's a restlessness to the future. There's a restlessness of, I don't even know why I'm here. What am I supposed to be doing with my life? I can't tell you guys how many people, especially when I'm, when I'm on active duty with the military, they come to me, it's like, they're, they're like, this is the most common one. Most common, actually, <laughs> when I was, a, I had to do a fill-in for two weeks for a Navy chaplain buddy of mine down at uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego. That's boot camp. And so I had to go fill in down there, and that's, this is what you hear most of all. I need to talk to the chaplain. And I heard this 75 times, that quote. Have a seat. Okay. So what's going on? I think I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. <laughs> and, and they realize that probably like in the first 30 seconds, you know. But... Um, you want to know why? Because they're soft. They're soft. And, the, and they're experiencing what real life and, and being, transitioning from being a soft person to being a, a, actually a warrior, what that transition feels like. And it doesn't feel good. Um, what's that? <laughs> so get this. Um, my advice to them was, um, okay, Toughen up and get out of here. Do you want me to pray for you? Yeah. But that's it. Toughen up and get out of here. Come back if you need prayer, but um, I'm, not, I'm not your mommy. I'm not going to rub your belly and tell you how, how bad things are and what you could do. I'm not going to do that. So toughen up and get back. That, you guys, is, is first of all, that's like... <laughs> Our calling is, is, is never going to be something like Isaiah. It's never going to be easy, but you have to be, you have to be available for it. You have to be available. I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, <clears throat> so number one, you have to have an encounter with God. Number two, you have to have a calling from God, not from you. Oh, and by the way, you have to be available. And what else did I, I forgot? How do you find your calling from God? Availability. And then number two, um, don't start with your skill set. Well, this is what I'm good at. This means what God wants me to do. Don't do that. Don't do that. Incomplete. Don't do that. Do you want to know why you shouldn't start there? It's because you're going you're to end up getting a calling from yourself. Look around at your community, your family, and find out where the greatest need is right now. 
The other one I like to say is look at where are your feet? Be where your feet are. And so maybe, maybe what God is calling you into right now is to be a great mother. Maybe his calling for you right now is to, he wants you to serve him and to, and to share him, is to, be a, is to work down at our, our kids' church area or to, be, or to be a greeter here or to be a, a great husband. Uh, how about this? I tell our Bellarmine football players, be where your feet are. Where does, and those high school kids, they're just so future-oriented. It's hard when you're that future-oriented to get present tense meaning because all they're thinking about is college. All they're thinking about is where they're going. All they're thinking about is, you know, the next thing and making money. And, and, but I, I, I tell them, God has put your feet right here. And, he said, and you could be a student, you could be a great friend, and God has put you here to be a football player right, right now for this season. So how could you glorify him in that? And they kind of laugh. I'm like, it's not too funny when you're in, on Friday nights and you're in front of 3,000 people and you could glorify him in a way that where you're not a punk, you're not getting personal fouls for unsportsmanlike conduct, you're helping your opponent up, you're playing hard, and you're loving on your teammates. That's attractive, you guys. Be where your feet are right that. That's winsome. That's discipleship. So look at where there's need in your community. Look at where God has put your feet. Where, so God has all of your feet somewhere right now. Where, what, where are they? And, what, and what, is he, what is he calling you to do within that? So number one, be available. Number two, look around where he has your feet. Look at where the greatest need is. Look at, look at where your church has a great need. Okay? Then lastly, and most importantly... You have to go on mission for God. It's not enough to have an encounter, and it's not enough for us to get a call from him. You actually have to move. What does God say to Isaiah? His first words. He says, here I am, send me. What does God say? Go. Then go. Yeah, your, your life's going to stink. Go. And that's the part where the rubber begins to hit the road. You have to go. Go. You go on mission for God. And what does that mean to go on mission for him? I want to share this with you. It means that the rest of your life is a complete and utter directional quest for him and his will for your life. It consumes everything. You don't have a career anymore. You have a calling where you carry out that career. And you know what God also does? You gotta be careful with him because he's goofy. He, he, he uh, no, seriously, he's, he's, he's wild now. He's, but he's, he's good, but he's, he's goofy. You know, you can't predict him. He course corrects with callings all the time. You're like, oh yeah, God's calling me over to that wardrobe right there. Wonderful. I'm here. I am, Lord. And this is this. We start to we start to go that way, and then he goes, boop. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa! I thought I was supposed to be a that. And he's like, nope. Back this way, over here. <laughs> you know. And then you're you're into it, and you're, you've been course corrected like five times, and it's different from the original. You have to be comfortable with God course correcting you as he as he works with it as he works with you and your calling. But you need to get a calling. And I wanna share something with you of people that are on mission for God. They've had an experience, they talk about it in this article. These people have had an experience with God. They've encountered him. They have a mission from him. They have, or they have a calling from him and they are on fire and on mission for him. Would that we could be like what I'm gonna read you right now that I got off the news just Friday and my jaw about hit the floor when I read the title of this article. I, 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 I'm shocked still as I read it right now and it tells me that our God is mighty, our God is active, he is moving, he is not absent, he is real. Jesus said, I'm with you always, even to the close of the age. He walks with us through the storm. You keep your eyes on him, you could walk on water and this is what I've, is, is going on in our world. There's mighty things God is doing in our world. There's mighty things that maybe I don't even see and most of us don't see from time from, that, that God is doing in our church at Emmanuel right now. And, and even in this city, I sense that the Lord may be doing something big like he, I don't know, that I think people are gonna start coming to the Lord and this article like sealed it for me. Title of the article, quote, where would you guess is the fastest growing, don't, 
don't guess, where is the fastest growing church demographic in the world right now? My mind immediately went to like Africa, China, uh, Korea, Iran. Iran has the fastest growing church despite no buildings and led and led mostly by women. No, but this is in a part of the world that is so oppressive to women, it's shocking. A new film tells the story of the fastest growing church in the world, an underground persecuted Christian movement in a country known for exporting radical Islamic terrorism, Iran. <laughs> but the Muslim majority nation's citizens are reportedly fleeing Islam in droves as believers bow their knee to Jesus. This documentary called Sheep Among Wolves, produced by a nonprofit group dedicate, dedicated to disciple making, highlights the untold story of the persecuted church in Iran. What if I told you, one Iranian, Iranian church leader said, what if I told you that the mosques are empty inside of Iran? What if I told you that no one is following Islam? Would you believe me? That, exactly, that is exactly what is happening. God is moving powerfully inside of Iran. By the way, that's happened before in history where God's moved powerfully inside of Iran when they were known as the Persians. The pastor added, what if I told you the... Um, Oh, go on. No, I won't read that part. He says, um, no, here he says, more Iranians have come to faith in Jesus in the last 20 years than the 1,300 years since Islam swept through Persia. Director Dalton Thomas calls the movement the Iranian Awakening. The church owns no property, no buildings, no central leadership, and is predominantly led by both men and women, but obviously way out of proportion leadership for that country that's very patriarchal, led by women. Named after the Bible verse, Matthew 6.10, which says, Behold, Jesus says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep amidst the wolves. Um, the documentary claims that Muslim background Iranians are leading a quiet but mass exodus and bowing their knees to the Jewish Messiah. But the new believers in the Islamic Republic face great risks. Listen to this, you guys. We know that if they get, they get us, the first thing they'll do to us as, as a woman is rape us, and then they will beat us, and they will ultimately kill us, one woman said. This is the decision we have, we have made that we want to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to him. Because I have, I have thought this when I wake up, that when I leave the door, that I might not come back. A leader of the Iranian underground church explains their goal is not planning churches, but rather making disciples, the majority of whom are women. And then he talks about the difference. Now I want you, as I read this final two, three sentences, the difference between a Christian, a, a follower of Jesus who's a disciple that has a calling and a trajectory to their life, the difference between that and the difference between just going to church. Because there is a difference, wouldn't you agree? Amen, right, wouldn't you agree? There's a difference between a disciple who is Jesus Christ has become their life and someone who just sits there. Quote, the pastor said, disciples forsake the world and cling to Jesus till he comes. Converts don't. That's his version of saying just they just sit there. He, Disciples forsake the world and cling to Jesus till he comes. Converts don't, the pastor said. Disciples aren't engaged in a culture war all the time. Converts are. Disciples cherish, obey, and share the word of God. Converts don't. Disciples choose Jesus over anything and everything else. Converts don't. Converts run when the fire comes. Disciples don't. Now, what do you want to be? For my money, for, for, for Danny Shaw, that's what I want for my life. That's what I want for my kid's life. That's what I pray for, for my church here, for all, for all of us here, our church. That's what we should be about. Disciples who look different, who are courageous, who, have, who, who are generous, who are 
quick to repent, quick to forgive, and have a sense of purpose, belonging, and direction to their life. That is winsome, you guys. And people take notice, even people that don't know Jesus and are perhaps antithetical to Christianity, they take notice of that. And that's what we're called to be. But, how many of you are willing to say, here I am, send me? This isn't just a, this isn't just a sermon. You know, I mean, this isn't just another, I mean, none of them are, but this isn't just another message to like, think about. It's either, it's, it's black and white. Either I'm not going, or damn the torpedoes, right? Here I am, send me. Oh my gosh. Kierkegaard called it the qualitative leap. Take that leap. Jump. Go. And you have a great scriptural passage which tells you, get an encounter, how to get a calling from God, and how to go on fire and go on mission for him. Now I'll share with you one last thing. I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to. Because I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good right now. And I feel... Um, and I'm feeling, I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling you guys good too. Um, you know what having a sense of calling is? It's the Christian version of what I'm going to read right now. So I should have read this first and then read the Iranian church thing. Because the Iranian church article is, is, is the Christian version of, of this, what I'm going to read to you about um, Marcus Luttrell. Marcus Luttrell was a... <sighs> part of Operation uh, Red Wing, which was in Afghanistan, where about he and his four-man Navy SEAL team were surrounded by about 100 and 120 Taliban fighters. The reason it's called Lone Survivor is it doesn't take a math magician to figure that out. He's the only one that lived. He says this, quote, uh, how many times were you shot? Shot, he begins during a recent trip in Dallas. Well, 11 times through and through. Broken pelvis, broken back, shoulder was torn out, my knees were destroyed, pretty severe facial damage, I bit my tongue in half, my right hand was destroyed from my thumb over to my index finger, that's about as much as I can remember right now, had to have my hand reconstructed, my back's been reconstructed, multiple back surgeries, my knees are blown out, my pelvis is cracked, I had a, a max, maxillofacial damage, you want me to keep going? I got shot, fragged by RPGs, grenades, 11 through and throughs, and my quads, calves, shrapnel sticking out of my legs and everywhere, all the skin off my back, and my legs were gone. He's the, um, the only one that survived. And then his buddy, who got the Medal of Honor, Mike Murphy, this was the citation. For conspicuous gallantry. What's conspicuous mean, you guys? Everyone could see it. Oh my gosh, you know, if, if, if some of you die in the next couple years and I get to do your funeral, which is likely, right? You know, I mean, we do, we, I just got done having, I, I just did a season of 12 funerals here at church. So um, I, don't be so scared of death. Jesus got, has got it covered. Um, <laughs> but wouldn't it be cool at your funeral if we could, you know, I could say, Karen, Dan, Rick, conspicuous gallantry for Christ. You could see it. For conspicuous gallantry, intrepidity at the, at, at the risk, fearlessness, at the risk of his life, above and beyond the call of duty as a leader of special war reconnaissance element with Naval Special Warfare Task Unit, Afghanistan. While leading a mission to locate a high-level anti-coalition leader, Lieutenant Murphy demonstrated extraordinary heroism in the face of grave danger on 28 June 2005, operating in an extremely rugged enemy-controlled area, Lieutenant Murphy's team was discovered by anti-coalition militia sympathizers who revealed their position to Taliban fighters. As a result, between 120 and 140 enemy fighters besieged his four-member team. Demonstrating exceptional resolve, Lieutenant Murphy valiantly led his men in engaging the large enemy force. The ensuing firefight resulted in numerous enemy casualties, as well as the wounding of all four members of his team. Ignoring his own wounds, and demonstrating exceptional composure, Lieutenant Murphy continued to lead and encourage his men 
When the primary communicator fell mortally wounded, Lieutenant Murphy repeatedly attempted to call for assistance for his beleaguered teammates. Realizing the impossibility of communicating in, the, in extreme terrain and in the face of almost certain death, he fought his way into the open terrain to gain a better position to transmit a message. This deliberate heroic act deprived him of cover, exposing him to direct enemy fire. Finally achieving contact with his headquarters, Lieutenant Murphy maintained his exposed position while he provided his location and requested immediate support for his team. In his final act of bravery, he continued to gauge the enemy until he was mortally wounded, gallantly giving his life for his country and for the cause of freedom. By his self, I love this stock line at the end. By his selfless leadership, courageous actions, and extraordinary devotion to duty, Lieutenant Murphy refl re reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Now, Christianize that. I'd love to say something like that at your funeral. Courageous action, selfless leadership, extraordinary devotion to Jesus Christ. Reflect great credit upon yourself and upheld the cross of Jesus Christ. What more would you want from a life? Nothing. Thank you, Father, for... Uh, I pray, Lord, that we would, um, I, I just, I don't know. I just pray that this would be more than a message, that there would be some life change, that we would um, go home and maybe repent and clear some clutter out of our life so we're available and have the courage to say, here I am. Here I am, Lord, send me. And so we pray this strong prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.